Let's talk about computational photography and the need for speed. Hi guys, I hope you're all safe and in good health. In a previous video about animal eye autofocus, I briefly mentioned the term computational photography. And this video is sort of about that. Although we might often think of cameras simply as devices that capture images, under the hood, digital cameras are basically dedicated imaging computers. And as modern digital cameras are continuing to evolve and become more capable tools, the dependence on processing power and the ability to move data quickly is becoming more and more important. In fact, we're already at the stage where the processor and the data input and output components are the major bottlenecks in performance. Although I want to talk to you about the more sophisticated cameras that we use for wildlife and action photography, I want to start with a more simplistic, although very related example. Now I've been on a search for some time to find a small compact camera that I can use to make videos like this one. I've spent a lot of time and I continue to spend a lot of time looking at and evaluating cameras from pretty much every major manufacturer, including Sony, Canon, Nikon, Panasonic, Olympus and Fuji, as well as from makers of smaller action cameras like this little thing here and this little thing here that's made by DJI and GoPro and other companies. And what I've been looking for is a camera that can capture great quality video and audio, but yet is compact to travel with. And most of these cameras claim to have some kind of face or eye tracking autofocus where the camera will detect the face or eyes of a person and then follow those elements in the frame and refocus to ensure they remain sharp. And what I found is that in practice, most of these systems can't be relied on. And I've personally tested many of them and I watch lots of videos of other people's tests and I read lots of reviews. At one stage, I even really wanted to buy a particular Canon camera, the Canon G7X Mark III, which was marketed by Canon as a vlogging camera. But its autofocus was an absolute disaster, even after they tried to address the problems later in a firmware update. And I made a video about that whole experience, by the way. Now, if you looked really closely at a couple of my more recent videos, which were shot on a Fuji X100V, you'll see a few places where the camera loses the focus for absolutely no good reason at all. Even when I'm not moving or not even blinking my eyes. And if I actually try to test the camera and move around, you can see how clearly the, the tracking lags. Now, unlike the Canon G7X Mark III, which Canon marketed as a vlogging camera, the Fujifilm X100V is marketed primarily as a stills camera, but it doesn't change the fact that it offers the feature of face and eye detection and tracking, but it can't do it reliably. And I should point out that this is a very, very recently released camera. It has 425 phase detect autofocus points. It's rated down to luminance value of minus five, and there's plenty of light when I've been using it. Now for comparison, when I test the uh, eye tracking with Sony's RX100 Mark VII, it does a fantastic job. And Sony made it possible by putting serious processing power in this camera, and that's why it's also capable of doing other kinds of tracking like animal eye autofocus and doing it all at 20 frames per second, just like Sony's full frame cameras like the A9 and A92. Now while autofocus and, and especially tracking autofocus systems do rely on other tech such as phase detection, which is more capable than simple contrast detection, and they rely on fast focusing motors in the lenses, it's the processing power that is the biggest bottleneck. And unfortunately, a lot of these small or lower end cameras have very little processing power to spare. And as a result, there are often times when the camera just can't keep up and deliver on the features reliably. 
Now let's get back to the high-end cameras that wildlife and action photographers are using. Those of us that shoot the pro Sony cameras know that the A9 and the A9 II, this camera here, are Sony's fastest focusing cameras. However, a lot of us love the A7R cameras. This is the A7R4 here, because they have high resolution sensors. Before the A9 II came out, a lot of people were really hoping that Sony would increase the resolution of that camera, but Sony didn't end up doing that. And that's because they were unable to process that much data and still deliver the same tracking autofocus and burst rates that people had come to expect. We also know that in the A7R cameras that have animal eye autofocus, one of the slightly annoying things is that you can't use animal eye autofocus in the tracking focus modes, even though animal eye autofocus is a kind of tracking focus. You can however do it on the A9 and A9 II cameras. And the reason for this is simply that the A7R cameras don't have the processing power that the A9 cameras do. Now let's talk about the Canon 1DX Mark III. Yes, it's a DSLR. There's been a lot of talk recently about the upcoming Canon EOS mirrorless cameras, but the 1DX Mark III is actually worth studying. Although it's a DSLR and likely the last high-end one Canon will produce, it's most impressive when it's acting like a mirrorless camera with its mirror up. It matches the A9's 20 frames per second, but with a mechanical shutter, and unlike the A9 and the A9 II, which can only reach those 20 frames per second speeds with lossy compressed RAW files, the 1DX Mark III can do it with no loss of quality. Now we know that the Autofocus in the A9 and the A9 II is great, but it looks like the 1DX Mark III has even better, faster and stickier autofocus. And part of that could be that it's doing all its detection with 3,869 dual pixel autofocus points. And that's a lot more than the number of focus points in the A9 and the A9 II. Also, because the 1DX Mark III is using CF Express cards, its buffer is pretty much limitless. It can handle an incredible 1,000 images in a single burst. So, so the 1DX Mark III is a beast for shooting action, and what makes everything I've just told you and a lot more possible is that Canon have put some serious processing power in that camera. The main processor is three times faster than the one they used in the 1DX Mark II, but it's 380 times faster at handling continuous processing tasks. So far, we've only talked about basic autofocusing capabilities, or at least what we've now come to expect as basic capabilities. Because it wasn't so long ago that cameras couldn't do any of this subject detection and tracking. But now it's becoming the norm. And we can also expect that these kinds of features will become better in the future. We're already at the stage where we have specific kinds of subject detection. Sony and Nikon have animal eye autofocus, where it can recognize the eyes of an animal. And in the EOS R5, Canon have announced advanced animal autofocus that can also recognize not just the eyes, but also the heads and bodies of animals. In the 1DX Mark III, the camera can recognize heads of people even if they have goggles or helmets on. And in that camera, it's, it's quite interesting if you look under the hood because it actually has two separate databases for subject detection. There's one database that services the optical viewfinder and autofocus system and metering system and that uses a Digic 8 processor. But there's also another database that services the live view autofocus and it uses the new Digic X processor or 10, maybe, Digic 10 processor. And they do this because the input from the OVF and the live view will be slightly different, so the recognition is going to be slightly different. The Olympus EM1X, which is this camera right here, is another camera that has substantial processing power. It can recognize planes, trains, and automobiles. That's no joke. And Olympus also recently re released the EM1 Mark III, which has an autofocus capability called Starry Sky 
autofocus, where it automatically recognizes and focuses on stars for astrophotography shots. And that's the kind of thing that you would usually have to manually focus on. And what's interesting in this camera is that under it, the hood, instead of using special processors, they chose to use a more generic eight core processor. And they did that because they believe it will make the system more flexible for future upgrades. At some point, we can also expect that this kind of subject detection will be able to learn so that the camera will improve uh, its abilities over time. And by the way, don't get uh, misled by the use of the words deep learning that, that Canon are using in the marketing of the 1DX Mark III and also Olympus is using those same words in their marketing of the EM1X. Deep learning doesn't mean that the camera is continuously learning and improving its subject detection over time. It just means that the recognizer or the classifier in the camera works by using a large database of images instead of relying on a algorithm or a model that has been specifically written to recognize characteristics of a certain kind of subject. So in this way, there is learning that happens at one point in the process, but it doesn't mean that the camera is actually uh, constantly learning and getting better over time. However, we already have lots of other things happening in the latest mirrorless cameras that are making use of greater processing power. Many of the cameras now have high resolution shot modes where they move the sensor around uh, and they take multiple exposures and they combine all of those into a single super high resolution image. And this takes a lot of processing power, enough that in the Sony cameras, you can't even get the final image in the camera. You actually have to go and complete the operation on a computer. But there are other cameras such as those from Panasonic and Olympus that are able to do all, all the processing in the camera and give you the, the final result uh, in the camera. The EM1X also has a, a live ND mode that stacks multiple images shot handheld. It simulates a, a long exposure on a tripod. And in fact, I'm, I'm sort of getting ahead here because there are many other things such as um, HDR stacking, automatic panorama stitching, uh, film simulations like Fuji has, uh, multi-frame noise reduction, uh, pixel level shadow and highlight adjustments that we've had in cameras for a while. And we're also now seeing features in smartphones which have serious computational power, such as the simulated shallow depth of field in Apple's portrait mode and Google's night sight which helps you take better images in low light. If you're not familiar with Night Sight, it's pretty interesting and you should check it out. It, it, it senses whether the phone is on a tripod or handheld, looks at the movement in the scene and looks at the available light and then figures out whether to take up to six one second exposures if the phone is on a tripod or up to 15 shorter exposures if the phone is handheld and it combines all of those and then does some intelligent adjustments to the white balance, to the noise reduction, to the tint and the sharpness. And that's pretty sophisticated. And the results can sometimes be pretty impressive. The problem with some of these kinds of features that we're seeing in the smartphones is they don't always look uh, entirely natural and they also remove the art and craft of photography that serious photographers actually enjoy doing and which typically will produce better results. So all of the things we've talked about depend on processing power in a camera. And yet it's pretty clear there are cameras out there that are underpowered in terms of processing ability. And as a result, they perform poorly or unreliably. And there's also cameras out there with an abundance of processing power and they're using that to deliver some advanced features. Because every camera 
uses a proprietary processor, we typically have no idea as to whether a camera has adequate processing power to deliver on its claimed features. When you buy something like a computer or a smartphone, you already know what processor is in it and how much memory it has, and this gives you a rough idea of how capable it will be. With cameras, all we can do is rely on manufacturer's claims and then test. So, how do you feel about the fact that cameras are becoming more like imaging computers. Are you a fan or user of some of these auto features, auto adjusting features and multi-exposure features that are already in some of the cameras, as well as some of the fancier features that we're seeing in the smartphones? Do you want or do you expect subject detection autofocus to get smarter? Uh, do you expect tracking autofocus to get faster and stickier? And do you expect to have all of that, those things at high resolutions and faster burst rates? I hope you've found this discussion interesting and informative. As always, I'd love to hear from you. Let me know your thoughts. Stay safe and keep well. See you in the next video.